Hi everyone, thanks for joining in today. My name is OSP Ram Kumar and I'm going to be your host today. This is, uh, we are live with our first uh, episode of uh, Exchange Tech Talk. This is going to be a series of webinars that will be conducted once every month and it will cover a lot of topics on software engineering starting with uh, cloud, AI, ML, security, data and so on. And uh, every month we'll try to bring you a variety of speakers uh, starting with in-house experts and industry analysts uh, customer, customers and partners of Zorient. And, and our idea is to enable a very healthy conversation on all aspects of software engineering through this webinar. And I hope this session will be useful for everyone who, that has joined in. And today our topic is beyond Xamarin and how to future-proof your mobile application development journey with AI. And I have uh, two speakers with me. One is Pinak Gore and the second is Melin Kadu. Both of them are from Zorian. They are our in-house uh, hands-on experts. And uh, let me allow uh, Pinak and Milin to introduce themselves and we can proceed further. Sure. Uh, thanks, Ram. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. So, myself, uh, Pinak Gaur, uh, I'm senior technical lead, having like 17 plus years of experience and in Dorian since last uh, 12 plus years, then primarily working on different flavors of mobile applications and uh, like uh, varying from mm -hmm typical applications, uh, games and all, right? So yeah, like I've worked on uh, both native as well as uh, different cross-platform frameworks. So yeah, looking forward to this exciting session. Uh, over to you, Milit. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Myself, Milit Kadu, and I have been working in mobile technology nearly from last 18 years. I've had hands-on experience with various frameworks like React Native, Flutter, Xamarin, and many more. From old school platform like Brew, G2ME to the modern ones like MAUI. I have worked on most of these frameworks. Yeah, and looking forward to this session. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, Milan. Thanks, Pinak, for that introduction. So, uh, before we start off with this to topic, right, like, can you give us a little bit of introduction about what Xamarin is and what is mm -hmm. the whole uh, story of you know Xamarin going end of support and things like that? And what does it mean for businesses? Okay. So basically, Xamarin is a cross-platform development framework that allows developers to create native mobile apps for uh, iOS, Android, uh, Windows using a single code base that is written in C-sharp. It was introduced in 2011, but it was more accessible to developers after Xamarin was acquired by Microsoft in 2016, and Xamarin was integrated uh, with Visual Studio. In 2020, uh, Microsoft announced multi-platform app UI, which was built upon Xamarin forms to provide a unified framework for building cross-platform applications. And uh, MAUI was officially released in May 2022. So uh, two years back, Microsoft declared the official end of support for Xamarin uh, and that it started from, that will start from May 2024. Yeah. Okay, which, which means I guess people will be now forced to migrate to other platforms. Yeah, so uh, basically if you see, right, like uh, over a period of time, right, uh, as software gets older, it leads to like accumulate uh, technical debt, right? And which means like you need to continuously keep on like uh, uh, updating it to make sure that it runs smoothly and it is like backward compatible as well, right? So, yeah, so I think. Okay, so, okay. Any any other particular reason why they have uh, uh, stopped support for uh, uh, Xamarin as such or any other disadvantages that the platform had, which which forced them to and say, you got to move out? Yeah, like from, yeah, like from a Microsoft perspective, like ending support is like, they just want to mandate the developers to move to, uh, newer framework MAUI, which they have introduced, right, which is .NET based, and it offers like uh, efficient and uh, uh, good integration uh, solution for building native applications uh, for uh, Android and iOS and uh, other platforms as well. So, yeah, that was from the Microsoft uh, standpoint. But from developers' perspective, I would say like uh, we have like. Uh, experienced few constraints while building apps uh, using Xamarin framework, like uh, 
like limited access to like open source tools uh, then like compatibility issues also with respect to third party tools and libraries and delayed support uh, for the uh, latest platform updates right and uh, uh, also it's a expensive solution i would say if we mm -hmm. compare it with the other cross platform frameworks and native solution as well and like it also uh, it uh, basically takes longer build time and okay. all the apps built are like larger in footprint. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so what does this mean to uh, all the enterprises that are using Xamarin uh, based apps today? Okay. So, uh, like after uh, uh, that, uh, the support end, uh, all, a lot of developers uh, have already started migrating or even completed migration from Xamarin to various other frequencies. However, there may be some app. Uh, that might not have even started this process, particularly those uh, that are not updated frequently on the, the store. Uh, end of support does not mean that the app would be removed from the store. And it also does not mean that the developers would not be able to provide update to the store. However, we have to keep in mind that without ongoing support, you won't receive critical security updates or uh, bug fixes that are provided by the OS SDKs. Uh, Xamarin development developers will be able to uh, use Xcode 15 and Android 34 to target iOS 17 and Android 14 respectively uh, to comply with the OS uh, store policies. But we should consider transition to more sustainable framework for long-term stability and compatibility. Got it, got it. So uh, uh, just a quick note to all the viewers, you know, we have a Q&A section towards the end of this 30 minute session and there's a Q&A option available on your uh, screen. So any questions that you have, you can all post it and we'll try to as answer as many as possible towards the end. And uh, back to the session. So uh, uh, what options do uh, businesses have? You know? How do they move ahead from now? If now that, you know, they have to migrate, you know, that's a, that's a given. How do they go ahead? Yeah, so uh, basically, like from developers' perspective, right? These are like exciting times uh, where you have plethora of options available, right? So, for uh, and it uh, allows you to have improved apps for the end users, with uh, wherein the development time uh, will drastically reduce, right? Uh, with respect to uh, implementing any new features as well as ad addressing the bugs, right? So uh, with this uh, new modern platform, cross-platform framework, as well as with uh, native development, you can have uh, a lot many uh, ways to like uh, give uh, very good quality apps to the, uh, deliver good quality apps to the end users. So yeah, and also like, uh, at broadly there are like two uh, ways right so, uh, one is using the native development where you need to provide support for a specific uh, operating system and uh, with respect to cross platform like you can provide uh, support for multiple platforms with a single code base so choosing between do uh, these two like uh, platforms uh, the approaches right is one of the most important like uh, decisions for any uh, mobile project uh, right to start with so this single decision can have huge implications right with respect to how the app shapes up right and what kind of technologies you you used while building it so yeah mm -hmm. so if i were to ask you simply right like what's the fundamental difference between these two options you know one is native and one is cross-platform okay so some of the uh, important factors that we have to consider when comparing native development with uh, other cross-platform frameworks that are in market are first, first the uh, like native development typically offers the best performance and user experience since apps are optimized for each platform it provides direct access to the API uh, platform APIs uh, the performance of cross-platform app is often lower compared to native apps due to its abstract layer uh, there is a bridging communication and uh, ecosystem maturity. Uh, new to developer uh, development typically requires separate implementations for each platform. Whereas cross-platform framework allows you to use a single code base, ensuring that uh, consistency in the uh, business logic. Uh, development time, uh, uh, we can say that uh, native approach uh, as we require a separate team uh, 
uh, for each platform is involved. Uh, this can lead to the increased uh, time and efforts. Okay. Yeah. And uh, cost-wise, like uh, uh, native mobile application development is usually costly as uh, we have a separate team and there is a separate code base uh, uh, which requires a, a, a separate maintenance. Yeah, so okay. in addition to what, yeah, like Melin, you covered, right? So there are few more uh, differentiators, right? So in terms of security, again, like native apps have an edge over the cross-platform apps since you have direct access to the platform specific built-in security features and also with uh, the user experience also right the look and feel uh, for the native apps is far uh, like uh, seamless and uh, consistent right because again they have like inherent access to the device os uh, interfaces and uh, coming to the updates right so again like native app developers would have get the first first hand access to the updated SDKs as soon as they are available. So any new uh, like updates, right? It typically comes with some uh, improvements or new feature, right? So the uh, native uh, APIs would be readily available as and when they are introduced. So and while uh, with respect to cross platform, there would be some bit of delayed since they are always catching up, right? So, yeah. And uh, again, like with respect to hardware integration, like if if your app involves any like uh, integration like RFID or Bluetooth or et cetera, right? So then it becomes a lot easier to develop the app uh, with the native technologies as providing support for various OEMs becomes a cumbersome job if you like are going with a cross-platform approach. So, and okay. last, uh, yeah not least the the footprint the digital foot, foot, footprint right so the apps uh, built uh, using the native apps are smaller in size as compared to the cross platform since it uh, cross platform adds all the abstraction layers on top of it so yeah okay okay so so let's say as a developer if i want to start building an application and i decide to grow go the cross platform route right for whatever reason let's say lower costs or uh, you know uh, you know, availability of skills or whatever, be it like, how do I uh, differentiate between each of these individual platforms? You know, what will be the best way forward? Or how do I even go about comparing these platforms? Okay. So uh, typically, uh, there are four to five platforms, cross platforms that are popular, currently popular in the market. MAUI, Flutter, React Native Nine. So ME is a successor of Xamarin, which is based on C Sharp and uh, example for development. So it is relatively new as compared to all other platforms. Uh, Flutter uh, is like it's gaining its popularity uh, and uh, the developers uses Dart, a programming language developed by Google. Uh, everything in Flutter is widgets, uh, like uh, right from the button uh, to the complex uh, layout and animations. Flutter also uses its own graphic engine called Skia uh, to render UI components, and uh, which increases us the speed drastically. Uh, React Native uses uh, TypeScript, JavaScript pro uh, programming language. It's it, it's as it's uh, older than most of the platform. It's the, the, it has a rich ecosystem and strong community support. Uh, Ionic can be used for building apps uh, which uses web technologies and has built-in support for popular JavaScript framework like Angular, React. Uh, to add new fun uh, native functionality to this app, it uses Capacitor, which is a native uh, a runtime built by the Ionic team. And there is one more platform that is uh, a creating multi-platform, which was re released recently. So uh, this is a new intro to this, uh, uh, what is a list of cross-platforms. Uh, one can build a UI with compo uh, Compose Multiplatform, which is a declarative framework for sharing UI across uh, the supported platforms. Okay, I think I think it's fair to say that each of these platforms are quite popular today, and uh, you know, uh, but but still, like I think uh, we've got a good overview of all these platforms today, right? Mm -hmm. But still, between these platforms, how to choose between these platforms, or what parameters should I uh, consider? Okay. So for like, there is no one size fit for all the solutions. And the optimal framework may vary depending on the specific need of the app what you are going to have. So some of the, uh, what do you say, uh, areas that we can consider are uh, 
uh, the platform what your app is going to target. So, so some frameworks like supports multi-platform like mobile, web, desktop, uh, and some uh, like Ionic only supports I iOS, Android, and web. Uh, in case of uh, MUI, it supports desktop and web. Then uh, time to market. So when it comes to transition from uh, Xamarin to like, if you're considering mig migration, so uh, uh, the first choice would always be MAUI. Uh, but the only considerations that Microsoft has in, uh, and also that Microsoft has also introduced uh, like guidance, how we can uh, migrate the existing Xamarin app uh, to MAUI. Uh, the only uh, issue with this is that uh, MAUI is still like relatively new and it lacks maturity compared with other uh, frameworks. Uh, and uh, 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 like this could lead to uh, severe like uncertainty, uncertainty. So in general, one can accelerate development using any of these cross platforms. Uh, the other factor is like uh, UX and performance. So uh, which is the very important one. So performance of all building uh, of app built using Ionic are on the slower side because it uses the web technology. But the architecture includes a high performance as it has its own rendering engine. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the fourth important is about the skill sets, what the team has. So we have to access, uh, assess the skills of your developer uh, development team. If they are expert in web technologies, then you can go for React Native or Ionic for teams that are proficient in object-oriented uh, language. Then they can grow for Kotlin and uh, multi-platform Flutter, MAUI. Uh, but it's uh, challenging to find developers with expertise in Dart uh, due to its low uh, popularity. So the Flutter, the, the only pro problem with Flutter is uh, uh, the Dart program language. Uh, uh, compared to all the uh, other languages, Kotlin prefer a slipper, uh, a steeper uh, learning curve. Uh, okay. Then comes to the development cost. Uh, while all cross frameworks are open source and available for free, INIC offers additional enterprise features that comes with a cost. So we have to consider these factors when you choose a framework. Okay. Okay. So I, th I think, I think uh, that's great, right? Like once we choose a platform, things like that, uh, one of the main uh, things that we are hearing today is AI, right? Everywhere, like uh, in, right in terms of content development to uh, building code to building applications, we are seeing AI. And uh, when it comes to mobile app development, uh, where can AI be used? Yeah, so like uh, Gen AI can be like uh, utilized. Uh, across various stages of SDLC, right? So right from the requirement phase, the gathering where you are gathering all the requirements, right? So you can have all the information in a one structured uh, document like FRD, right? So, mm -hmm. and uh, for the design phase, again, like you can uh, basically generate all the mockups, wireframes and working prototypes, right? Uh, based on these uh, gathered requirements. Uh, as an input so yeah and again like uh, using these wireframes uh, with these uh, new uh, ui tools uh, you can like generate code snippets which can like uh, rapidly like uh, uh, increase your development like it can save you on the development time so accelerate it so and again like for the implementation phase like you can uh, generate the code from scratch uh, providing the input uh, with respect to which language you want to cater to and also with respect to migration also, right? So you can provide uh, the input as the uh, these, uh, the one that you want to get, uh, like uh, uh, it would be uh, the source uh, language and on top of that, you can like convert it to the, the targeted platform. So yeah, that is uh, with respect to the implementation and uh, using the, uh, the GPT-4 uh, as your open AI models, right? So you can leverage those for such kind of uh, conversions. And uh, with respect to testing again, right? So you can uh, generate the test case as well as test scenarios uh, mm -hmm. using the uh, the uh, requirement gathered that 
uh, during the design uh, the uh, first phase right so requirement phase so this way you can streamline your uh, the overall uh, delivery process which wherein you can have uh, like uh, tremendous savings in terms of the overall uh, effort and the time spent right so yeah okay so uh, looking at this uh, slide right i'm uh, i'll be tempted to say that you know ai can be used uh, across the board and it can really help with uh, you know in, in speeding up things right but what's really stopping the adoption of ai to its fullest and what are the or rather if i were to ask what are the challenges that typically people face when they want to adopt uh, ai in their app life cycle yeah so there are still like uh, concerns right uh, among using ai uh, at org level or uh, like so the first thought that comes right to our mind is is my code safe or like who owns that code right so those kind of questions come to your mind as in when you come up with this question so yeah so in terms of security like uh, uh, for instance like azure open ai right it has the enterprise uh, solution wherein it works in the uh, provide all the secure environment for all the uh, ai tools and it uh, includes all the strong security measures for the data protection as well so so uh, with respect to uh, like the azure open ai right you uh, your prompts the training data as well as the the output right uh, it is uh, like safe it is not uh, available to any of the customer or it is not used by the open ai models to train uh, or like it is not available to any of the microsoft or any like uh, third party services right so mm -hmm. basically models are stateless so so they do not store any of the uh, the uh, generated uh, data right in the model so or the prompts as well so yeah that's for from the security standpoint and the other one i would say is uh, the training data right so till what point the model is trained so what we have seen is uh, for instance the gpt4 is uh, trained till uh, september 2021 so if any uh, like uh, if any api gets uh, deprecated right after this uh, period then the model is not aware of so it it the chances are that it can generate uh, deprecated code and also if there are any new apis or any new approach that are like introduced right uh, after this uh, uh, mm -hmm. 2021 so the model won't be aware of so it might not be able to generate optimal code so okay. yeah, those are the things but now what we are seeing is at least with the preview versions uh, for uh, gpt4 uh, like uh, the the data i think it is now uh, coming very close to the the current date so now it is i think pointing to the uh, september i think uh, 2023 uh, data so yeah so we are seeing some positive trends there uh, and third one i think yeah the legal one right it's it's an unknown territory like uh, from the ownership perspective like uh, uh, who owns your data right so so azure open ai it uh, clearly states that you own your data so they have no uh, right over uh, like they cannot uh, like modify or uh, claim that it is their uh, the, the uh, converted code that gets generated it is there so and again with respect to copyright also like uh, things are still not clear like there are few gray areas around that and the terms and conditions also like uh, again like it varies from one service provider to another so so people in the legal circles are still like not sure uh, what it means right since it is mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, it is new and it is like rapidly uh, changing right so and so still yeah i would say it is still an unknown territory okay okay so yeah i, I guess uh, somewhere i see a lot of positives and some negatives but I think uh, day by day, the adoption is only increasing and hopefully all these gray areas will get sorted out uh, in the coming months. Um, so uh, Pinak and Milan, like, uh, so far we've been talking a little theoretically, like, you know, uh, where exactly have you used AI in your projects or uh, development, uh, you know, life cycles? Can you give some examples from your uh, experiences? And by the way, quick time check, we have about five, six minutes left. Okay, sure. So yeah, I I can think of one like uh, 
the one that we are working on basically it's for one of the retail client right so they have the existing apps uh, built using xamarin for ios and android platforms and like one of the major pain points of the customers was like uh, integrating rfid uh, device reader sdks right for various oems so this often uh, revolved around like de delayed support for for newer os versions right and any of the security or the bug fixes so there's always like a delay in terms of the time to market and like causing frustrations uh, with respect to the stakeholders right so, so uh, based on the like feasibility study right the Zorant was involved uh, in that stage so uh, we uh, basically came up with a solution where we can migrate uh, to uh, native uh, platforms uh, using native technologies right with uh, using Kotlin and Swift uh, languages for uh, Android and iOS. So, so this would basically foolproof the uh, the uh, application. Right, it's a complex application, and uh, with the latest in technology, you are always sure like uh, the app is uh, foolproof uh, with respect to any new APIs introduced. So, and uh, also with respect to the uh, uh, like the tools that we have used right to expedite like we have uh, 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 in addition to gen ai where we have used prompts to migrate right from uh, uh, from c sharp to kotlin like we have also identified few open source uh, utilities like for transpiling the code uh, wherein we can take care of like interfaces data models and uh, like the basic classes wherein we can save the time there uh, for uh, manually uh, converting those classes so yeah, again, with respect to uh, UI creation also, like we have uh, built on top of an open source uh, utility, we have Python scripts wherein we can convert all the uh, XML files, the layout files uh, to compose, uh, which is a declarative UI like so, yeah. And uh, again, for the, uh, with respect to unit testing, right? So uh, we have like built a Python script again to, to uh, cover like two, three patterns, right? Which we've, feel are like uh, uh, commonly appearing for the different test cases so that way like overall i would say like we have saved around 30 to 40 percent on the uh, total effort and time yeah okay okay so in terms of uh, uh, your approach to migration is there anything that you want to share any tips or tricks or anything with respect to how you use chat gpt here yeah, so like using Gen AI, right? Uh, like uh, here we had uh, we have used like Azure Open AI, where in the prompt in the prompt we are passing the C sharp file, uh, and and uh, response it generates a Kotlin file, right? And we need to verify this uh, code, right? Uh, whether it's working or not. So in the Android ID, we need to verify that, and if it is not working as a as expected, then we need to refine the prompts. And over a period of time, like we we come to a stage where we get uh, like see results uh, on expected lines here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. And uh, yeah. uh, anything there like, yeah, Sorry. Like, yeah. There are few like prompts uh, that we we initially like uh, started with, right? So the basic prompt we started is uh, like. Uh, your task is to convert the code uh, right from C sharp to Kotlin with the with the given file, and so that was the, just a basic prompt that we started. And then over period, we we kept on refining based on the different scenarios we encountered. Like in the code, there was some dependency with the layout file, so we had to pass that uh, layout file also as part of the prompt. And uh, we also in few scenarios saw that it was. Uh, generating deprecated code so we had to like refine the prompt uh mentioning that there should not be any deprecated uh, uh specific class or method right and uh, okay. then we eventually we like came up with a very generic prompt saying that no deprecated classes or method should be like used and we need to follow all the kotlin uh, standard like coding standards so Okay, thanks, thanks, Minak. Uh, Milan, anything from your side? Anything, any inexperiences you want to share? Yeah, so uh, I want to share a, like uh, there was there's one of the project where we have migrated from uh, Xamarin to React Native. So our client uh, is operating with supply chain environment, 
specialized in real time data collection and monitoring for audit and quality analysis so uh, on uh, one of the platform milan hello am i audible yeah, i think we lost you milan for about a minute uh... hello am i audible now yeah now you are so we had uh, some of the issues with our existing app like uh, bluetooth connectivity and uh, uh, we had to depend on the third party uh, keyboard for the scanning the barcode and uh, like migration to other framework was the best opportunity to address these issues uh, the client approved migration to react native uh, considering factors like cost uh, the expertise the team is having and the uh, time by when we can deliver the application so during our migration uh, process, we also used Azure OpenAI, uh, the, what was explained by Pina, the same tool, and it utilized to convert around 20 to 20, uh, 25 to 30% of the core business logic, which was written in C Sharp to a TypeScript. For barcode scanning functionality, we integrated Visual uh, Vision Camera plugin, which utilizes ML Kit under the hood. So ML Kit. Uh, kids pre-trained barcode scanning model enables real-time detection and decoding of various uh, barcode uh, types. So uh, there was one more, uh, uh, what do I say, uh, we have used uh, Azure OpenAI uh, for a streamlining test case generation. So we converted the acceptance criteria uh, of a story into test cases using prompts which resulted in approximately 35 to 40 percent useful test cases around there were 10 to 15 uh, redundant ones or repetitive ones and around five percent unique test cases were generated that would not have been uh, that could have easily been based by the QA so overall uh, using this gen AI the project delivery time was uh, uh, reduced by 25 to 30 percent okay Okay, so is it is it safe to say that uh, if you're not using Gen AI, um, you're you're definitely losing out a lot on in terms of uh, you know overall cost projects and even your overall time to value. So in Zorient, uh, based on our experience, uh, some of the projects uh, Gen AI development can be accelerated by three folds, and it mm -hmm. will result in poten potential cost saving up to uh, around thirty to forty percent. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. So, um, to to all those potential, you know, enterprises out there who have, uh, you know, their apps on Xamarin or who are migrating or who are thinking of uh, building new applications, how can they work with Zorian, a company like Zorian? So, yeah, like Zorian can help the enterprise, right? With, uh, I think we have basically three uh, models here, wherein we like work closely with the end customer. Uh, where uh, where we are like uh, end to end involved end to end uh, right for right from the requirement phase uh, to uh, estimation design and actual execution testing and if required publishing the apps to the store right of, on behalf of customers so uh, here like uh, we uh, this can be for a uh like an existing app or uh where uh, we need to migrate it to some other technology or it can be for some greenfield development projects as well and the other model like uh, is more of an extended uh like approach right where the orient engineering team will work uh, with the uh, the customers engineering team following all the agile methodologies and the typical scenario would be like in case there is some tight deadline and the customer is uh, uh, needs to accelerate the project right then uh, there in uh, like Zorian can pitch in and uh, expedite it so yeah and the the third one is basically bridging the talent gap right so if there is a skill gap in the existing team on the customer side then Zorian can help uh, bridging that uh, talent gap so yeah Okay, thanks, Pinak. Uh, that that that's quite helpful. So I I think we have almost uh, reached the end of our session uh, today, and we are already a couple of minutes past our uh, uh, target time. So we'll just see if you have any Q and A's. Uh, so there's this, uh, and just, we'll just take one question, Pinak and Milan, before we close. So this is one question on um, uh, 
how do we uh, you know uh, the question exactly is um, you know how do i encourage my organization to adopt ai technologies okay so yeah like it uh, depends right you need to like understand the needs of the uh, the specific area right within your organization where ai could potentially fit in and provide significant value, right? So there could be automating some repetitive task or improving some decision-making process or enhancing the customer experience, right? So so basically you need to pinpoint on some concrete use case and that would strengthen like your argument. And also you need to like uh, basically have some case studies uh, or examples where other organizations have uh, like grown right or they have successfully implemented ai solutions so that could be one like uh, uh, reference point for you and again like uh, roi roi right so you you need to see how much uh, like return on investment you can gain right using the ai or ad adopting the ai uh, with respect to a particular solution and again like to start with you can first uh, come up with some proof of concept and some pilot project, right? So that would basically uh, give some, uh, you can gain the confidence of the, the relevant stakeholders, right, in your organization. And uh, also like in terms of concerns, which we already covered, right? So we need to uh, give reassurance that the data is secured and uh, like uh, there won't be like any implications there. So yeah, so uh, those kind of things, I think uh, you'll basically need to, uh, uh like uh, gain the confidence of your uh, stakeholders yeah got it got it thanks thanks pinak so um yeah so i think that that brings us to the end of our uh, first episode uh, and thanks everyone for joining in and thanks once again to our uh, expert speakers milind and pinak so uh, stay tuned we'll come back with another episode in the series uh, next month so till then thank you <laughs>